Hello everybody and welcome to Play Some Video Games, the official podcast of the Canadian Trampoline Team. This week sitting at the big boys table with me is none other than Q. How you doing Q? USA, 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 USA. I'm doing great Kevin. I'm feeling very patriotic because the Olympics got started tonight, like, you know, like an hour ago, depending on how much of that ceremony you watched, but I'm doing pretty good. Cool, cool. And with us as well is Nathan. Hello, Nathan. Hello. And sadly, Coach Mo was supposed to be with us this evening, but he is actually out coaching. So there you go. So, Coach Mo, you are missed this weekend, buddy. We will talk to you soon. Um, So I guess we'll just jump right into what we've been up to. So, Q, take it away. Yeah, man. So, like always, I feel like I'm repetitive, but it's going to happen again. I've been playing a lot of Halo 5, and actually, I will say a lot more Halo 5 because the crew that I usually play with is kind of active again, and everybody's kind of like jumping on board. Um, So, we played maybe like three or four times this week. Also, I've been playing a lot of Destiny because one of my friends picked up the Taken King like a year later, and so we're all on that. And we're just kind of getting hyped up for the Rise, uh, Rise of Iron, which is coming out in September. And actually, my wife and I are playing uh, a lot of Thumblestone, I think. that It's like Tumble a Stone. Tumblestone. Tumblestone. She likes those puzzle Tetris kind of games. So it's a game that's right up her alley, and she loves it. So, yeah, man, it's just been uh, a, lot of, a lot of shooting and a lot of just... Uh, and obviously, since last time you called me out, Pokemon Go. So... Yeah. <laughs> what level are you now? I am 22, and I saw that Coach Mo is 23, and that kind of made me really <laughs> mad. But at this point, I have to make up a hundred thousand experience to level up. So I am halfway to level 23. So we're we're that's we're, a lot of we're working on it. That's a lot of pidgeys. That's a lot of pidgeys and rattatas. Whoo! All righty. Uh, well, Nathan, how you been? What have you been up to? I've been doing fine. How are you guys been? Oh, just peachy. Excellent. <laughs> uh, for me, I've been playing a little bit of games here and there. I finally got my Xbox set up in my mainstay area. I think so. I wasn't on last time, so I did a little bit of a Assassin's Creed Syndicate. I played a little bit of that. That was one of the last games that I bought before my hiatus. And that's been a lot of fun. Um haven't had a chance to really dig back into it as of late because I've been busy. Actually, since last time we recorded two, I met Mr. Mr. Reese, Mr. Donnie Reese, famous oh, uh, right. Twitter handle uh, Play in Nintendo. I met him down in his hometown of Georgia, and we had breakfast, so that was pretty good. But other than that, uh, just been playing some stuff here and there. I did play a little bit of Peggle 2 because, you know, I I can't go too long without any Peggle in my life. So (laughs) a little bit of that, and uh, yeah, that's pretty much it for the gaming front. I haven't had a lot of chance to dig into a lot of things yet, but hopefully uh, this weekend I'll get some more time. Yeah, there you go. So you guys are so short, and I feel like I'm going to talk a long time now, but I think it'll be worth it. So uh, on the gaming front, um, if you guys follow our YouTube channel at all, I did the entire game of Saints Row Gat Out of Hell and streamed that on YouTube, uh, so you can watch that if you'd like. It's only three different sections, uh, but not for the kiddies. It is a mature-rated game, and very much so. Um, so I beat that pretty quickly. It only took me two two days, I think, to beat it. Um, and then after that, I jumped into Bully, uh, the PS2 game that was brought over to PS4. Uh, I've been playing that, having fun with that, um, surprisingly well upconverted. It's not a remaster by any means, it's just playable on PS4, but the, you know, it takes away the loading times you used to have with PS2, which were so long, especially at Rockstar Games, um, but having a lot of fun with it if it's basically Grand Theft Auto in a private prep school, uh, but it's, it's pretty fun, so I'm having a good time with that. Um, other than that, I did play some Pokemon Go, as always, with the wife and kids, uh, but I'm way behind Coach Mo and Q. I'm only a level 14, I believe, so got some work to do there. Uh, but last night, I decided, and I, I messaged you guys on the chat, that I was actually going to sit down and play a sports game. Uh, so I was about to jump into NBA uh, 2K16, because that was a, a free PS Plus game. Yeah, I said free, Donnie. That's right. I'm on Kyle's side. Um, and... 
you know, it was all good. I jumped into the game. I was like, all right, I'm going to play the story mode because I heard it's kind of ridiculous because Spike Lee did it. So I was like, this ought to be fun. Created my character. And uh, I was back home, and my daughter called me downstairs because she needed the Netflix password to stream some video. So I, I had gone downstairs, entered that in for, came back upstairs, was just about to sit on my couch, and something flew right by my face. Whoa. So I immediately jumped up, and I, I was like, oh, you know, yelling. And uh, I wasn't sure what it was. I was like, oh, was that a bird? Like, I wasn't sure what it was. Walked into the kitchen, and it flew by my face again. And, yeah, there was a bat in my house. Wow. So I did what any city boy would do, you know, the manliest of manly actions, which was to immediately run into the basement and slam the door. (laughs) Uh, So my daughter's downstairs wondering why I'm running down at like 10 o'clock at night slamming the door. And I was like, all right, don't panic, but there's a bat in the house. And she's like, what? And no sooner than I said that, I turned around and looked at the door as if like to point at the door to her. The bat crawled underneath the door and flew at my face again. So at this point, she screams because now she sees the bat. And I, I dropped to like the floor because it was like right at my head. And I told her to run upstairs back to her room and I'll make sure it stays down here. I was like, go grab you know your big pillow from your room and we're going to block the bottom of the door and trap it downstairs. So she's like, okay, okay. She runs up the stairs, runs to her room. I make sure the bat stays downstairs. Uh, so then I run up the stairs, close the door, grab the pillow, put the pillow under, you know, in front of the crack in the door. And I'm like, okay, cool. We, we got it taken care of. We're safe. So she's like, well, what do we do now? And I'm like, in my head, I'm like, I have no idea what the heck I'm going to do. But, you know, I got to be the dad. So I was like, all right, well, let's let's once again do the manly move. And I'm going to call my daddy. So I, I go to call my dad because uh, he's had a few bats in his house. So I knew he knew how to handle it. I had never seen a bat outside of a zoo in real life. So uh, I was going to go give him a call. So I was like, all right, you know, to my daughter, I was like, give me your cell phone. She's like, uh, it's downstairs. <laughs> I'm like, awesome. So I go to reach for my cell phone. And apparently I threw it at some point in the basement as well when the bat was swooping around my head. So both of our phones were in the basement. Uh, Eventually we did get a hold of him. He's like, all right, I'll be right over. You know, we hang up the house phone. We use the landline at that point, which I kind of forget we have one because we literally never use it. Nobody even knows the phone number for it. Um, So he's like, all right, I'll be right over like 15 minutes because they live nearby. Cool, no problem. Hang up the phone. We're like, all right, good. We're safe. And she's like, Grandpa on his way. I'm like, yep, we'll be good. We'll be fine. Just then something flies by my face again. So once again, we scream. And I'm like, oh, my God, there's two bats now. So my daughter makes a beeline to try and run to her bedroom, but sees that her door is closed. So she takes a turn and jumps in the bathroom, close, slams the door closed in the bathroom. So I, I run down, too, to make sure she's okay. And I didn't want to open the bathroom door and have it fly in there. So I went into my other daughter's room and close her door so we're across each other in the hallway and she's you know she's pretty scared at this point she's like what do we do what do we do and i was like i don't really know because i'm freaking out just as much as her and i was like you want to try and run outside and she's like okay so i was like all right you know on three we're gonna run i was like stay low to the ground i was like hold your hair back you know so it doesn't fly in your hair or anything like that and because you see that in horror movies all the time Mm -hmm. uh you know so she threw a towel over her head to make sure her hair didn't get caught and she was gonna run for the door so we call, you know, count down one, two, three. We open the doors, and make a run for it. Uh, the bat once again flies right down the hallway at my head again. So I push her ahead of me so she can get out the door, and I kind of distract my distract the bat, I guess. I don't know by yelling and swearing a few times. Uh, so she gets outside. I end up ducking back into the room because the bat's like at my face. Uh, so then at that point, I'm like, all right, I need to get out of the house because now she's outside by herself at like ten o'clock at night. Uh, so I need to get out of the house. So I, I you know open the door again kind of peek down the hallway I don't see anything I'm like cool coast is clear it must be flying around or maybe it went you know the hallway the other hallway or something so I go to run and I'm running for the front door I get to my living room and the bat is on the living room floor so I freak out jump back and kind of end up running out the side door <laughs> I run out I go outside door and I walk to the front of my house where my car is parked and my daughter is sitting in the car like completely pale faced, wide eyed with her hands on the steering wheel, just yelling, I'm not going back in the house. I'm not going back in the house. <laughs> so at that point I realized the cat is still in the house and now I'm worried that the cat's going to get bit or something like that. So I was going to open the front door and see if I could leave it open and maybe the bat would fly out because it was flying around those rooms. So I open the door and the cat come, starts walking towards the door. So now I'm really worried she's going to get bit. So I call the cat over, I grab her, put her in the car with my daughter. Uh, and then, you know, uh, leave the front door open hoping the bat's gonna fly out and of course it doesn't 
Uh, my dad shows up eventually, and he kind of goes in the house, and literally within like two minutes, found the bat, caught it. He basically slapped it with a towel, and I don't know if you guys are familiar with bats, but they kind of just get stunned if they're scared. So it just dropped, and he just covered it with a towel and threw it out the threw it out the door. So that that was taken care of. But now you know we're very worried. Obviously, I have a baby, so we gotta make sure there's no bat droppings or anything like that. I didn't know when it got in the house, how long it's been in the house, whatever. So we search the house, every room in the house, like multiple times upstairs. Don't find the else. Like, all right, cool. So we'll go downstairs, get the other one. Uh, turns out there wasn't one downstairs. Uh, it was the same one, and it got back upstairs and scared us. So luckily, it was only one bat. But that was my my funny anecdotal anecdotal story, I guess. That's not a word, <laughs> but you know what I mean. So basically, I was a big complete coward in front of my daughter. So. Yeah, and now I'm terrified of bats. So one step was, closer to being one step closer to being Batman, though. I look at it that way. So I was I hoping you'd say, yeah, <laughs> I, have, I have a bat cave technically, and now I have PTSD from bats. So it's all good. I was hoping that you were going to say that it wasn't a bat; it was a robin, and oh. and oh. you know I wanted to tell you that the the best part of or the easiest way to take care of a bat is to tell it bad jokes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, oh so. I basically, I got little to no sleep last night, so I'm quite tired. So if I nod off at some point in the podcast, you know, just yell real loud or something. We'll just keep going but, without you, man. We're just gonna yeah, like, just just gonna just make go it like, into like a anime podcast. You know, we'll just flip it. <laughs> we'll flip it, man. Yeah, just start talking Star Wars for three hours. Or yeah. Three. Oh yeah. There okay. we go. Exactly. <laughs> so yeah, eventually after my adrenaline went down and it's like way later, I did play some of the NBA 2K and. I found it really funny. So, you know, you create your own character. So I made one that kind of somewhat looked like me as best as I could. Their character creation isn't that great. And I didn't have I I don't have a PSI. So I couldn't do like the, Hey, I'm gonna take a picture and have it make it for me deal. Um, so start the story mode and it starts off with you and your hometown at, at the local basketball court and your buddy shows up and your sister's there. And it's just really funny because, and it's probably just because it's Spike Lee or the game developer was a little lazy, I'm not sure, but they don't give you any voice options. So even though my guy is a red-headed white guy, I very much have the voice of a black man. Nice. Uh, and my sister is black, and my dad is black, so it's kind of just really weird and awkward the way it does it. just didn't have any conversion, I guess. So it's kind of You were adopted. It's okay. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's the only thing I could think of in my head, and I was just like, oh, it's really weird, because like, every other game, if you pick whatever you know skin for your character they kind of apply it to any family members that may show up and they just didn't do it in this game so i don't know i uh, played a couple of games at the high school level i guess before i get into college and then to the nba but it just seemed really slow to me i mean i don't know it's been i've been it's been a long time since i played a sports game and i think the last basketball game i played was like nba street or nba jam um it just seemed really really slow and not very high scoring and stuff so i don't know it's it just kind of weird I'll, I'll give it a couple more games and see if it picks up when I get to the NBA. Hopefully the game speeds up a bit, but it's just kind of weird. And the whole shooting using the control sticks, I, it just seems really weird to me. I'm used to like pressing a button twice. You know, you got to time it right the, at the arc of the jump to, to get the shot. And no, you like flick the the knob, the, the control stick to shoot, which is weird to me. But I don't know. That's enough for me. But yeah, so <laughs> played some games this past week, was a big old chicken, and traumatized by bats now for the rest of my life. So all good but that's enough from us we like to hear from you so gentlemen it's time to dive into the messages message for you sir and our first message comes via xbox live from user the colonel panic and he would like to know it's a she by the way sorry about that sorry sorry about that (laughs) She would like to know, I apologize, uh, which Pokemon is our favorite. So, Q, since you are clearly a much higher level Pokemaster, if you will, Mm -hmm. I will go to you first. And which is your Mm -hmm. favorite Pokemon? And let's throw in why. I just want to mention that I am a champion in the Kanto region, the Sino region, the Johto region, the Unoba region, and the Kalos region. I just want to and the know. and the Lobo region and the Lobo region. Mm-hmm. That's right. <laughs> um, this is this is an easy question. The, the Colonel Panic. Uh, I know you personally. This is this is a, this is a this is a, this is a what do you call it when it's an easy question? Is a no brainer. A no brainer. Yeah, but it's like another whatever. When like when you implant people in the audience to ask you uh, easy questions, I don't know what that's called. 
Softball question? Softball. There we go. I feel like I always blank out on very common expressions on the podcast. Um, my favorite Pokemon is the best Pokemon, and that is Charizard. Since I was, I guess, seven or eight years old when Pokemon came out, Charizard has been my favorite Pokemon, and he will always be my favorite Pokemon. The only reason to why Charmander and Charmeleon are so popular is because they turn into Charizard. Charizard is the king of fire Pokemon. He is a flying fire type who can also learn dragon attacks. In addition, he is also Ash Ketchum, Ketchum's strongest Pokemon up until Pokemon uh, XYZ when Ash gets a Greninja and Greninja can Mega Evolve. But who cares about Greninja? He's a fighting frog. We're talking about a fire dragon. Charizard is Ash's best Pokemon, and he is the coolest Pokemon that you can ever come across. He can learn Fire Blast, he can learn Overheat, he can learn Flamethrower, he can learn Dragon Rage, he can learn a Hyper Beam, and Fly, and Dig. He's like the all-around best Pokemon ever, and I'm pretty sure that if I had a Charizard in real life, he would be my best friend. Hands down, drop mic, I'm out. Boom, there you have it. Uh, so Nathan, I know you don't have a ton of experience in Pokemon, but do you have a particular favorite and or why? So I do like the illustrious Charizard. <coughs> it is, is a great Pokemon. And in fact, in Pokemon Go, I chose Charmander because, you know, he turns into Charizard. Well done, sir. But, well done. <laughs> but <laughs> I, uh, I mean, I gotta say my favorite Pokemon is Pikachu. I mean... Get out. It's it's Please. classic. <laughs> it's, he's, he's a classic little guy. You, you, I watched the cartoon when I was a kid, and you, you grew to like him a lot as a character and as a sure. companion. And it's just, he's just so, he's so gosh darn cute, you guys. Uh, he's, he's just, <laughs> if, if there was such thing as Pikachu's, I would want one. You know what I mean? Uh, yeah. And, yeah. and the fact that he has like so much power with him, he's electric power and it's just really cool so pikachu is my guy and i know that's like a a super generic answer but it's like hey i i like that one a lot because you know i've i've i like mew uh mew is probably my second but you know out of all the other ones it's just they're all kind of after a while they just repeat each other and they don't have a lot of depth to them or characteristics but i feel like pikachu has a a, a good character and uh that's that's why he's my favorite I mean, there's nothing wrong with that. It's clearly the most popular Pokemon for a reason and stood all these years. So that makes sense. It's like saying, um, what's your favorite ice cream? Oh, I don't know. Vanilla or chocolate. That's, that's not that's not creative. There's no thinking in that. I'm, I'm ashamed, Nathan. I'm ashamed. Favorites favorites don't have to be creative. It's favorite. Know. You know, what if my favorite ice cream is vanilla? Then I would say you, get salted caramel because you're missing out. Now you just but, heard his feelings. But But vanilla is everything. And nothing all in once. That's right. <laughs> it's like the, it's like saying your favorite color is white. It's like that's that's like that's like the the is that the absence or is that all the colors combined? Is You're that, just that's... making me feel terrible. Today. <laughs> <laughs> well, Mo's not here, so I have to go after somebody. You know, I feel like I should... <laughs> I'm sorry, Kevin. What's your favorite Pokemon? Uh, that's okay. Uh, so I'm I'm kind of in the same boat as Nathan. I have two kind of sort, I guess. Uh, for me, the first one that came to my mind was Mewtwo, uh, just because if you saw the Pokemon movie from the original one, he was a complete badass, uh, and I always liked him in Smash Brothers uh, using Mewtwo when he came to the to the scene in Smash Bros. So, like that one. Uh, my other one, which is more of a basic one, is uh, Eevee. I like Eevee because all the different transformations Eevee can turn into. You know, you get Jolteon and Vaporeon and Flareon, and then all the new ones. Uh, you know the fairy type, dark type, and all that, all those things. So I just kind of like the potential that that Pokemon has. That depending on whatever your game style is, whether you like electric type or whether you like psychic type, whatever the case is, that Eevee can fit into that mold, however you want it to transform. So I always like that aspect that it was kind of no specific Pokemon, and every Pokemon all in one had the potential there. So those are my favorite. So thank you, the Colonel Panic, for sending in the question. Keep them coming. Uh, so our next question comes from Justin, who writes in, As football season is quickly approaching us, what is the pro football team you support? Uh, so this time, let's throw it to Nathan first. Who's your football team? I don't think I can answer this right now, honestly. What? <laughs> because my team moved from the city of the city that I grew up watching them in, 
uh, the St. Louis Rams, ladies and gentlemen, were, for the longest time since I ever started watching football, my team. Last year was their last year in St. Louis because their owner, in his infinite wisdom and, let's say, his greedy, money-grabbing snatches, wanted to move it to a more lucrative area, and he moved them to the Los Angeles, California metro area. So that means I can't drive down to the Edward Jones Dome and go watch him this year. This will be the first year I've not seen a football game down there, and it's going to be kind of sad. Um, I'm not going to go out to L.A. to go watch him because, I mean, it kind of feels just weird, right? You know, I just, it's not home, you know? I grew up watching this team at this location, and yeah, I know that they were in L.A. before. They're just going back to the L.A. scene, but they were in they were in St. Louis for the entire time that I knew what football was. Um, so I grew up watching them and really going to enjoy that team, and them being in St. Louis was a huge draw for me because I liked the local scene. I liked to be able to go see a team locally and support them, and... So now I don't know who my my team is anymore because the Rams were my team and I was with them through thick and thin. I mean, we've had a lot of terrible seasons in the past few years, <laughs> but I've I've always been a Rams fan and it's just you know it's just a weird scenario uh, and I really don't know. Uh, still at this point, going into the first preseason game this weekend. I don't know who I'm going to really watch or root for. I'm, I'm kind of taking the agnostic approach of maybe I'll just be a fantasy football fan and just watch the players that I like, you know, from my Ouch. fantasy team. That's tough. Sure. But yeah, it's just, it's, I, I can't, I, I, I'm not going to yet say that I'm not going to support the Rams, but I'm, I, the love isn't there. You know what I mean? The love is gone uh, because they left me. I mean, it's okay, Nathan, because, I mean, Everybody hurts sometimes. Everybody, Everybody hurts. hurts. I'm, so, I'm so glad that happened. Isn't that the okay, next slide? Isn't that the next but before, before all of our <laughs> listeners start crying at our singing performances, uh, Q, who is your team to go to this year? This is an excellent question, Justin. You, my man. I love you. I don't know who you are, but I love you anyway. This is a great question. Keep them coming. Um,. This is interesting because I am in North Carolina. I've been living in North Carolina, in the great state of North Carolina, for the past uh, 16 years. So I am a Carolina Panthers fan. That's right. Cam Newton, number one, baby. Boom. Good time to be a fan. So. It is a great time to be a Carolina Panthers fan. They did a survey this past season of how many North Carolinians call themselves, consider the Panthers their number one team. It was a 66%. So basically, like six out of every ten North Carolinians were Panthers fans. the The season before that one, they did the same survey. It was thirty three percent. So <laughs> there's a lot of bandwagon fans right now that we need to kind of get rid of. But it's an interesting question because I went to NC State University, which, if you are familiar with Russell Wilson, <clears throat> excuse me, Russell Wilson, the quarterback at Seattle was the, the university that he played at the first three years of his college career before he moved to Wisconsin, and he played his final season with the Wisconsin Badgers. Well, if you go to Carter Feeling Stadium, our stadium down in NC, at NC State, we have Russell Wilson's number retired in the stadium. So we still consider him part of our breed of football, so, which is tough because – the Seattle Seahawks and the Panthers are both in the NFC. And last season, this past season, they met each other in the playoffs. The Panthers took out the Seahawks out of the playoffs. They knocked them out. So I am a Panthers fan first. But it's tough sometimes when they play the Seahawks and I have to root against my boy, Russell Wilson, who I will add is the most boring football player that ever existed, like personality-wise. But it's the most <laughs> exciting football player when it comes to watching him play on the field. So, yeah, Panthers fan all the way. I know Cam has personality issues. I get it. But, yeah, still my team. I still love the Panthers. But, you know, when, when the Seahawks are not playing the Panthers, I like to see Russell Wilson uh, win games. So that's that's what I got. There you go. I, I must say Cam Newton, I think, is a phenomenal 
athlete. I mean, especially last year, it was incredible watching him play. It just didn't look like anybody was going to be able to stop them. Obviously, they didn't win last year, but, I mean, it was crazy. I'm not crazy about his personality. No one's crazy about his personality. No one. He needs to, he needs to have some discipline, I think, a little bit, and I think this year he might be a little more humble coming into it. I just think he blew up really big and didn't really know how to handle that, if you will. Um, but excited to see what they do this year. Um, for me, I I mean, come on, I'm a new, I'm from New England, oh, so gross. Yeah, it, clearly a Patriots <laughs> fan. So I know all the controversy and stuff, mm. and I I get it, I get it. This year it's gonna be tough. It's gonna be interesting to see what happens without Tom the first four games of the season. You know, plus you got a bye week, so it's it's kind of weird, especially in the fantasy football realm. What do you do there? You know he's guaranteed points when he plays, but that's going to be five weeks of fantasy football. He's not on the field, so. Who's he throwing to these days, anyway? Gronk. Gronk. That's it, though, right? Uh, yeah, pretty much. It's on and off. Yeah. Some uh, Edelman. You got Edelman. crazy thing about Brady is that no matter who he has on the field with him, he makes those players better. That's crazy, man. It, yeah, he really he, does. He can have the crappiest brand new rookie receivers and somehow they will grow up in a matter of weeks it's crazy he's he somehow he brings out the best in his team that's i don't i, I i'll give him that i'll give him that he, he really does he knows how to take you know i don't want to say underdeveloped athletes but he can take athletes and he just brings them to another level i mean he, he goes to his people he has he gives them confidence so but yeah it's pretty much julian edelman and uh and gronk for the most part so you said he um, develops under under Inflated balls? What was that? <laughs> I, I'm not going to get into this debate. But there are plenty of NFL <laughs> players that support him and say that they all do it and even admitted it. So, I don't know. Whatever. Either way, he's not playing for four uh, games. I agree with his decision, though, to not continue to pursue it. Uh, I wish he didn't even take it as far as he did. I wish he just kind of said, you know, I did nothing wrong, but whatever, and just kind of sat down and took it in the first place. But. It is what it is, and we shall see what happens. But, yes, New England fan for me. Patriots all the way. Um, So, yeah, that's us on football. So our last question this week comes from our regular writer-inner, Josh. Uh, This this question is more for you two uh, because I had addressed this in the NX Shack episode that if you haven't listened, go back a few. Uh, Donnie, Jason, and I talked about all the leaked information about the NX that came out that everyone's saying is, is confirmed. Just Nintendo hasn't said it yet, but everybody else is literally saying it. By uh, the way, he, Kevin, I was surveying the Xbox Empire recently, and I saw some smoke coming from the area of the NX shack, <laughs> so you might want to go check that <laughs> out. Bum, 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 bum. So uh, th- th- this will go really well into the next question then. Uh, so Josh wants to know... Is it just me, or are you guys disappointed in the Nintendo NX leaks so far? I'm not very impressed. What do you guys think? Uh, his basic overall concerns were the controller, suppose it, well, the mm-hmm. rumored controllers being detachable, uh, and then the price point, which I we've heard both that it's going to be really cheap, and that also it's going to be like $300. So he was alluding more to the $300 price range. He feels it's too much. Uh, he was burned by being an earlier adopter to the Wii U, and then the price drops came like crazy on that too. Um, so he's just a little bit leery from what he's heard so far. He kind of just wants to see it, uh, and I get it. I'm as I said on the podcast before. I'm I'm concerned about the detachable controllers, and I want to see how that works. But if they're really talking about a handheld device that's almost not quite as powerful, but almost as powerful as a PS4 and Xbox One. That can also then hook up to your TV afterwards. That sounds, in in theory, like a great idea to me. But he wants to know from you guys what you think so far. So I will throw this one. We went to Nathan first last time. So let's go to Q. So Q, what do you think so far about the, the rumored NX leaks? No, this is interesting because I was listening to uh, the NX Shack um, podcast. And it's, uh, it was funny when you guys were talking about, I think you and Donnie went back and forth about what you imagined this looked like when it was described when you read about the leaks and it's funny how each of you came up with different like mental pictures of what this was supposed to look like i think donnie imagined like a screen with two like detachable like like control sticks kind of thing maybe i think maybe that was donnie and then you you describe maybe something else and it was interesting because how like how different people are imagining different mental pictures of what this looks like um Am I disappointed? 
not really, man. I, I, I feel like I don't know enough to be impressed or to be disappointed. Does that make sense? I feel like I, I don't know enough. I, I do worry about what this technology looks like. If it's something that you mm-hmm. can carry around and it's portable and yet yeah. it's supposed to render high level graphics because just three years ago we had a massive Xbox One that you could like use as a freaking like, you know, mortar brick, you know, like, oh, maybe, <laughs> you know, and like, yeah. so, and now even, even like uh, the PS4, P, uh, Xbox One S, which are way smaller consoles, which are, I mean, so my question is. What was the quality of experience that the gamers will get from this device? And is, is there going to be a fallout in Nintendo fanboys and, and buyers who are like, you know what? This is just not what I want to play. So mm-hmm. I feel like at this point, I don't know enough to be disappointed. I do wonder what kind of technology Nintendo has developed to render a high level, high quality gaming experience in a device that can also be portable. I, I, I'm, 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 I'm cautious. And I, honestly, I, I, I will basically give a no answer. I am not disappointed, but I'm also not impressed because I feel like I want to get some official stuff coming out from Nintendo about yep. what this looks like. Um, yeah, so I, I, I'm sorry, Josh. I didn't give you a full answer, but I just I, I want to know more. Uh, I want to know more. Yeah. I, I agree with you. I, I got nothing wrong with that answer. And, uh, you know, all signs point to Nintendo making some sort of announcement at the GamesCon coming up uh, in, in August. So we hopefully will know something soon enough. Uh, you'd imagine with the console launching in March that they got to do something soon. So we shall see. And, uh, you know, we'll, I'm sure we'll revisit the topic later again, too. So, uh, Nathan, what about you? What's your opinion so far? My opinion so far is that I am sorely disappointed with these leaks these should not be leaks these should be facts that nintendo is giving us at this point uh, the speculation is just hurting the nx it without any sort of confirmation or anything from nintendo there's nothing to talk about because they could all come out and say <laughs> you guys where did you get all this information from this is hilarious and then everything that everybody's thought just is discounted right so this game system is going to be out within the next, what is it, what are they saying? At least the next 12 months, for sure. So No, no Nintendo even said themselves it'll be out in March, so. Yeah, they so said at least that much, though. So. They need to tell the people what it is. And mm-hmm. their, their whole thing about, oh, we don't want people to copy us. No one is going to copy you. You don't have to worry about that. They don't have time to copy them. Yeah, I mean, Microsoft exactly. is doing Scorpio, PlayStation is doing VR and yep. doing Neo. Nobody mm-hmm. is going to copy you. Sega's not coming back. No. <laughs> um, so they just need to come out and say, this is what the unit is. This is what our you know designs are for it. And this is what our vision is. They need to clarify this message so that the speculation stops. Because what's what are we gaining from it at this point? We're gaining false expectations, false hopes that will not be met and that will cause disappointment no matter what. So Nintendo needs to get this information out into the public so that way speculation stops. If I may add one final point, Kevin, and I'm sorry, I, I, I don't, I don't want to cut you off or anything, but um, I do wonder because because Nathan was talking about you know like Nintendo communicating to the fans and to the gamers properly, and I wonder because Nintendo obviously is a is a Japanese company and its executive and corporate leadership is still very much Japanese, you know like the the people running the show are Japanese Absolutely. businessmen. Yep. And everything that I get, all the media content, all the news content that I get is American Western media. The most un-American I get when it comes to my my new my gaming content is Eurogamer, and you and you know like British. Uh, uh, IGN, IGN UK, and stuff mm-hmm. like that. Yeah, I have no idea, to be honest, how Japanese gamers view Nintendo and what their perception of of this is. And I wonder if at some point Nintendo is trying to release or not release information to the world, and they're doing it in a way that it sound it, it feels completely natural to their national core audience in Japan. But to us Westerners, it sounds like a bad job. Mm-hmm. So I would love to find somebody who could fill in on that. Maybe we have someone in our team who can who knows about it. I don't know. But I would love to come up, have a conversation with somebody who tells me this is how the Japanese view marketing. This is how they view um, 
I don't know, news releases, PR, et sure. cetera, yeah. and see if it's any different from the way Western companies do because I feel like I w- there would be something to learn about what, why Nintendo does what it does and what it, and what it doesn't do by understanding more of how their corporate culture sees their own market. That's it. No, I, I agree with you. And, I mean, in, in Japan, I know this much, that uh, the handheld market is huge between cell phone gaming and even just gaming consoles. I mean, Nintendo DS is, like, king over there big time so if they're able to put out a high powered handheld in japan that's going to be huge but if it's weird or quirky like you know may or may not be according to the leaks it may not connect with the audience over here which let's be honest more consoles are bought in the u.s than there are bought in japan but obviously like you said it's a very japanese company very still much in that same culture so they're going to try and appeal to their market first i believe which just makes me wonder like does Reggie just like bang his head on the desk all the time? But you know, being you know head of Nintendo of America, you'd expect like he must be like screaming, "Guys, come on, do something!" At some point. But uh, so, real quick, yes or no question from you guys: If Nintendo does not connect with this, is this the last console for Nintendo in your opinion? Like, is this the last hurrah they may have, whether it connects or not? Nathan, what do you think? Nintendo does what no one else should, right? They're... I don't... I don't understand. They they have a loyal uh, gaming base, you know? A lot of people who were Nintendo people went to Sony because Sony had the better graphics, right? Sure. And now Sony is getting a lot of those indie scenes, and now Sony is innovating. And Sony has the portable... They're 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 solidifying their hold on these old Nintendo fanboys. So, in time, yeah, they will lose the market share and they will fade off because they want to keep making the Wii. They want to try to get that innovative console, which there's nothing wrong with innovation. Don't get me wrong, but they need to listen to what the gamers want. Don't try to tell the gamers that this is what they want. Your your core knows what they want to play, how they want to play, and they just want to have a great Mario game or a great Star Fox game. Come on. Don't try to make it this weird. They could have had another amazing Star Fox game if they would have just let you use the, the Nintendo Pro Controller and play through it that way. But no, it forces you to use the the Wii U gamepad. It's that kind of thinking that forces people into this box that they do not want to be in that makes them go to Nintendo or to Sony or to Xbox or wherever else and say, you guys got the games I want to play the way I want to play them. I I can't support Nintendo. So eventually, they will probably fade off. Nathan, that was a great yes or no answer. I appreciate it. <laughs> hey, <laughs> I'm just, you I'm know, just messing with you. You know, I, I, can't just, I can't just say yes or no. You know that. No, I know. No, that that I agree with you. As an, as a Nintendo fan and being the the resident Nintendo fan on this specific episode, I, I agree with you though too. It's I I'm God, I love their games, but I am not digging their hardware or their approach or their release schedule at all right now. So I'm on that fence where this if they miss on this for me, I might be done. Hmm. Except for the the NES Mini, because I'm definitely getting that thing this holiday season. But regardless. So, Q, yes or no, if Nintendo misses on this one, is this their swan song, their last hurrah for gamers? Yeah, uh, the answer is no, it is not their last hurrah. Because there's an article that came out about six months ago, maybe maybe it's closer to a year ago, where it said that Nintendo can keep losing, I think, tons of money for the next 75 years, and they can still stay on the market. So, No. Nintendo is not going anywhere, and they will keep releasing the products that they want to release. They're not going to be driven by popular opinion. They're, they're going to release what the executive corporate leaders of Nintendo feel they want to make, and they want to mass produce. So, if anything, the only changes that I can f- see coming in the future for Nintendo is maybe releasing some of their first-party IPs and allowing other consoles to make them so they can make mm-hmm. money from PlayStation and Xbox. And I will get to that uh as we discuss Xbox later in this podcast, I'll, I'll touch on that topic again. Cool, cool. So basically, your opinion is Nintendo will take the iPhone approach where we're just going to make what we want regardless of what people actually ask for and we'll still expect to sell tons. 
yeah, I mean, they can they can burn money forever. Like, it's crazy how much money they have uh, in reserves. It's crazy yeah. how much money they have. They do. They do. I, I've seen the news on that, too. So, all right, that'll wrap it up for messages. Uh, and as always, don't forget, everyone, to send us your questions. You can reach out to us at underscore PSVG on Twitter. You can hit us up on Facebook at facebook.com slash play some video games and follow us there if, you ha- if you're not already. Uh, and then, of course, you can always email us at... Uh, podcast at play some video games.com. So thank you everyone for sending in your questions. We appreciate it. So now we're going to dive into the main topic for this evening. And, you know, I think it's pretty safe to say that amongst my cohorts this evening, uh, that Microsoft is king amongst you guys. And that's your preferred console, the Xbox one. Uh, so I kind of wanted to take some time this evening and dig into why and what drives you and really make you and really kind of pick at the mind of an Xbox fan. Um, I'm going to throw some questions to you guys, just kind of get your opinion on it, and I'll throw in my two cents with my experience with Xbox as well, because, yes, folks, I did have an Xbox at one point, too, so I do have some insight. I don't hate Xbox for the matter, just not my preferred console, that's all. So, all right, so let's throw it this way, guys. Um, so for me, the first thing I want to say is, what was the first gaming console you owned? Uh, and kind of how did it lead to Xbox? What's your console story? So, you know, to kind of give you an example, I'll set the example here. Uh, for me, my first gaming console was an Atari, which then went to Nintendo. Uh, but by the time I got married during the age of PS2, um, that's when I got a PlayStation. My first PlayStation was a PS2. I had that, then got the PS3. Uh, and then I was fortunate enough through work to get a free Xbox 360, and that's what brought me to uh, the 360. Um, so I'm not going to dive too much into the story there because I'll touch on some other points later on that. But that's what brought me to the Xbox 360. It was just kind of happenstance because uh, my gaming experience is pretty much all Nintendo and Sony. Uh, but then it kind of fell into my lap that I got a 360. So that was my first exposure. So uh, Nathan, how about you? What was your first gaming console and kind of how did it lead up to you on the path of Xbox now? A long, long time ago <laughs> in a galaxy far away. My Xbox had Obi Wan. It was around the time of, of Episode One, uh, and the Xbox came out with the Star Wars Obi Wan game. Does anybody remember this title? Okay, I didn't think I so. I do not. No, I don't remember <laughs> one. <no. laughs> so that's just a taste. But the first console that I owned that I remember purchasing myself was a PlayStation Two when it first came out. Um, maybe it was a PlayStation. I I honestly can't remember, but it was either a PlayStation or a PlayStation Two. And then I bought a PlayStation Two launch day, and then it came down to this one, you know, option. I wanted to play the Star Wars Obi Wan game, and I also wanted to play Star Wars Jedi Knight Jedi Outcast. And I was looking at the options. I was like, well, I could spend three hundred bucks on a graphics card for my computer, and I could play it on there. But I couldn't play Obi Wan on there because Obi Wan wasn't on PC at the time. But it was on Xbox. So and I was like, well, I could also play all these other games. And they got this other cool stuff like Halo and out, stuff out there that I want to play. And I'd rather play on a controller, I think. So that's what pushed me over to the Xbox side was the fact that I wanted to play Jedi Knight, Outcast, and Star Wars Obi-Wan. Those were the first two games that I bought for my Xbox when I got it. So as a lot of technology purchases are influenced upon or reasons why I get something is influenced upon is Star Wars literally that's my journey a lot of places that's why I have a PlayStation 4 right now I have the Darth Vader uh, placed uh, PS4 downstairs oh yeah right and I the reason why I got a computer that could run you know game stuff is for Star Wars The Old Republic and there's just a lot of things that pushed me over to the xbox ecosystem right and i looked at the hardware and i was like man this hardware is actually better than the playstation 2 so it had a hard drive that was built in and you could you know rip music to it and you had your game saves were on the drive and it was just really innovative and there was a built-in ethernet port and with the playstation you had to buy the adapter and all this other stuff like man they they're really forward thinking and then there was xbox live and xbox live was just amazing experience with the voice everybody had the voice chat and it was just so engrossing. There was a great community that started to be built around it. Again, the the most exposure I had to an Xbox Live game was Star Wars, uh, The Clone Wars. 
that was one of the first Xbox Live games that I played and played a ton of. And so I started building this community that I still have friends to this day on Xbox Live because of it. Uh, how many years is that? Like 13 years later, whatever it is. It's a long time. But it's, it's been a long time. And I've, I've stuck with Xbox because I really like the ecosystem, right? I went from the Xbox to the Xbox 360 uh, because it was, you know, the high definition system and the PlayStation was just severely overpriced at the time. And then, you know, I, I was able to play with my friends again, and that was a big draw, right? Was my friends that were getting Xbox 360s, and we were like, okay, what, what game are we going to play? This is going to be really cool. And getting introduced into that high-definition gaming generation. So, uh, you know, you went from the Xbox to the 360 to the Xbox One now. Same friends are still on both of them. Um, and it's... The community really kind of makes me like it a lot but the other thing that i really find myself gravitating to the xbox for is the controller for me for my hands and for the way i play the xbox elite controller the xbox one elite controller is the most amazing controller ever i started to fall in love with the xbox one s um, wait the xbox s controller back on the original xbox days because it was that versus the playstation dual shock 2 and those uh anti-symmetrical thumbsticks just my fingers work better in that position I, I can go back and forth between the ps4 and the xbox one controllers even to this day but still prefer the xbox controller because of those asymmetrical sticks mm-hmm. um and then the triggers work i i am i'm better with those triggers than i am with the l1 and r1 buttons or l1 and r2 with those buttons on the top of the playstation controller yeah my hand, I mean, I'm sure it's just conditioning over time. Sure. And I could go one way or another. Like, I was playing Uncharted, and I eventually got past the uncomfortability of the PlayStation, because literally it felt uncomfortable. It didn't feel natural. It didn't feel right. But uh, to me, just the responsiveness, and with the release of the Elite controller for the Xbox One, that thing is a game changer. That thing is, it's hefty. It's amazing. It's It feels good in your hands. It feels like, it feels like it's a, a pristine piece of equipment, right? It doesn't feel like plastic. It doesn't mm-hmm. feel like it's going to break like a if gun, you dude. drop it. It feels like a gun. <laughs> it, it does, literally. I mean, if you... It, it, that's actually a really good analogy. I've never thought about that, but, you know, you, you take a gun and you feel it in your hand. There's a little grips and stuff on there, and you got the the cold metal, and it, it does actually feel a little bit like a gun. Maybe that's why I subconsciously like it. Um, but it's it just feels really good, and... and the ability to interchange the thumbsticks to make it the way you want it to go with like a taller thumbstick or a smaller one, and then you got the back button paddles where you can really customize that to to make yourself never have to move your thumbs from your thumbsticks and triggers and everything. Just it met, it lets you play exactly how you want to play, and PlayStation just hasn't done that. Nintendo hasn't done that. Nobody yeah. can do that except for Xbox or the PC platform. You can't customize it to that level that you can on Xbox. Even if you don't have an Xbox uh, Elite controller, they let you go into any controller and customize it. You can switch buttons around and change things around to the way you want to play. So let's say a game comes out and like, oh, this is the way you have to press this button to do it. You can be like, no, I don't. Go into your controller settings and change that in your in your devices. Their, their messaging when the Xbox One came out and was announced was very muddled. It It was very... It very much dictated by a corporate strategy that was bound to fail, yeah. that the people who really needed to run it, like Phil Spencer, probably wasn't listened to because the, to overall the, strategy, <laughs> the overall strategy was to be the center of the living room, to be the entertainment platform, to have TV, to have everything supplied through this one box. And in a sense, they were able to do some of that, but... That's not what gamers wanted. Gamers and the people that are buying an Xbox are buying it to play games. Yep. And that's where, you know, they had a huge player base with the Xbox 360. They could have easily, had they had the right messaging, transitioned most people from the 360 over to the Xbox One. But now, in the past two years, like since, literally since Phil Spencer has taken over, you can see how the ship has been avoiding the the crags of the the side of the cliff and it's been going out into pa- into the great sales because now you have the Xbox 360 backwards compatibility which is a a huge a boon uh for the Xbox platform that I'm surprised that I 
care about as much as I do and yeah. use as much as I do. And pairing that with the Games with Gold program that you get, now you get on on the Xbox One, you can get four new games every month. Two Xbox One exclusive games, or that are only on Xbox One, rather, and then two backwards compatible games that are going to play on the Xbox One. And I could see that, honestly, with, with this new PC and this Play Anywhere campaign, I could see them expanding that out and adding two Windows uh, games that you get if you have Xbox Gold every month. That'd be really cool. Yeah. Because with Play Anywhere, you can play uh, in the future Gears of War or uh, Forza, and stuff like that. They're they're making this interoperability now just really, really cool. And they're the only player that can do that. They are the only company that has the infrastructure and that understands the cloud computing that it would require and the networking behind it and make it work in a way that you can trust that it will work. Um, but yeah. So I think this is long, longer than you anticipated when we talk about it, but my gaming journey basically started with with PlayStation, and I still, PlayStation has a great, I, I still like a lot of the PlayStation games. I'm, I'm not as hard of an Xbox fanboy as I feel like I portray myself to be, but, <laughs> sure. but I do, when it comes down to it, and I, I got like Assassin's Creed on, I could get it on the PlayStation or on Xbox, I'm going to get it on Xbox for the mm-hmm. fact that I love the controller. Uh, the achievements, they mean more to me than trophies, so if I'm going to earn something, I'd rather earn achievements. And the community that I have on Xbox is just fantastic. I have amazing friends on Xbox, and you know, I know that there are great people out there that I just haven't met yet on PlayStation, but the fact that I already have these great friends, I'm not going to try to leave them or anything like that. I'm going to play games with them on the system right. that we all have. And get that group chat up and say, hey, what you guys all playing? And we're going to go play this tonight. Okay, cool. It's it's such a communal experience now. You know, and not not to jump ahead to the end of the podcast or anything, but recently I wrote a, a piece for the uh, Play Some Video Games site. And just talking about, I, I think I entitled it Gamers, Who Are We? Right? And how the common misconceptions are. We're just people that are stuck in their grandparents' or parents' basements eating Cheetos, Right? But really, you look into it and you look at online gaming culture, you look at what gamers can do when they come together and communities that are built because of games, and it's generally positive, you know? In my personal experience, I've had amazing friendships built. I've met a few people that I've met online, and it hasn't been, you know... When you meet somebody for the first time, it could be awkward, right? But if you spend time playing with people, you kind of just already know about them, and you just chill out you know it's like you're you're launching a a game of destiny or something like that but you're just actually walking through a town talking about stuff and just chilling it's it's just the community on xbox and that is the biggest draw to me and the fact that they promote or not promote but they really have a good backbone on that community that every xbox ships well, before the Xbox One S, every Xbox would ship with a headset so you could talk to people online. Or the Connect, you could have voice chat functionality. The original Xbox Live came with the starter kit had the, the communicator in it. They really want you to talk. They want you to talk about the game, obviously, but it, it blossoms past that into an amazing experience and into great friendships that can last on and become even more amazing. So... Anyway, I think that answers your question. I, I, I'll let Q talk some more now because I don't want to take all his thunder. I was about to say, you answered that question. You answered three other ones I have under this main topic. <laughs> and you even went to the plugs that are at the end of the show all yeah. in your in your speech. But no, like I try to be thorough. Slam. No, I, I, I agree with, with what you said on pretty much everything. I didn't mention this uh, when I talked about my, my journey as far as consoles was concerned. One of the reasons the Xbox got turned off for me, but like you said, I think this is all due to conditioning, was I couldn't deal with the Xbox controller. That thing messed me up coming from PS2, PS3, uh, and then Nintendo's different anyway, so it don't really matter. But having the Sony controller for two generations and then trying the Xbox... It messed me up, and I mean, I would play. I've played all the Gears of War except for Judgment. Yeah, because that was the last one. Uh, I played them all with my buddy uh, on his Xbox 360, so I was able to get through those games. But I mean, those weren't re- terribly long games, uh, and I was playing with him. So if I was kept pressing the wrong button, there was somebody there to back me up. So that was different. But the controller is one of the things that kind of hurt me as far as staying with the Xbox. Continue on with that. But uh, how do you feel about? Go- 
How do you oh, feel good. about the Wii U Pro Controller? I, I like the Pro Controller. I'm good with that. So my curiosity then is, how is the Pro Controller that much different from the Xbox Controller? I think the two the the two sticks. There's not two sticks on the Wii one. Yeah, there are. Isn't there? No. No, you're right. Okay, yeah. that's right. There's just yeah, there's I, the I one on the left side. Yeah, I think it's the sticks not being symmetrical, which that's what you liked about the Xbox One. I think that's what messed me up from the PlayStation ones, where they always were together. So then reaching around messed me up, and the triggers I always found weird. I actually had a. It's funny you say you had a hard, you have a hard time with the R one L ones on the PlayStation. I had a hard time with the top two on the Xbox One, whereas I thought your triggers were good, uh, which PlayStation kind of copied with the PS4 anyway. They're a lot closer uh, to that structure there, but the the top trigger buttons I always had a hard time with, and then just the the buttons kind of being, in my mind, backwards threw me off too. But One more question. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so with the controller, mm-hmm. I I always have, ever since I can remember, I've always played inverted controls for the sticks. Are you inverted or are you non-inverted? I'm normally whatever the game default is. I can do either way. It doesn't really bother me either way. So I just go with whatever the game has built in. And some games will have inverted, some games won't. But most do the inverted. So I'm okay with it. It doesn't bother me either way. I think there's a science study to be had here on (laughs) symmetrical sticks and inversion rates. Could be. Kyle, get on it. (laughs) Yes, Kyle, Kyle, start doing research in the lab. Get to work. We'll check in with Kyle next week on that then. Um, all right, so Q, what about you? So what was the first gaming console you had, and how did that lead to you and your, uh, I don't want to say bias, I want to say favoritism, your your preference towards mm-hmm. Xbox? No, I actually type up my notes because I, as I was listening to Nathan, I was like, man, I would have gone longer than Nathan had I not. Uh, had I not Wait, you ty- had time to type up notes while Nathan was talking? No, no, no. <laughs> No, I type when when you release the show notes. I I know I know typed up notes because I was like, man, I could talk about this for like an hour, you know. Um, my first console was a Nintendo. I want there's a legend out there that Lobo Rican was conceived thanks to a Nintendo NES. Now I don't know there's <laughs> people in our audience that are probably young, so look up what conception means in the dictionary. Um, I remember playing. <laughs> I'm sorry. I remember what playing- game. I remember playing a lot of Duck Hunt. I don't know, man. I, I think it's, I told you it's legend. We don't know all the facts. It's on the power pad. <laughs> Track and field. Oh, Sorry. my goodness. Go oh, my goodness. I remember playing a lot of Duck Hunt, Super Mario, Metroid, and all the other classics in the Nintendo NES. As a family, I always play video games with my parents. Uh, so I'll, that's, a, that's a big, that's a critical point in my journey as a gamer because since a young age video games is something that i did with other people and i, I really want to touch on that uh down the road as, as we continue this conversation uh shortly after we bought a super nintendo and then we got nintendo 64 and the key games that i bought were mario kart golden eye mario party and super smash brothers once again critical to all those games is the fact that they are all games that you play well you can play them by yourself but what I remember about GoldenEye is having four controllers hooked up to the 64. Sure. And yeah. the screen divided into four screens, which now I, I, it would be really hard to do that again because I'm like, oh, my God, I can't see anything. But uh, at that point, we didn't know any better. Um, when I was in high school, and man, I, I feel like I, I, bought a, I bought a GameCube late. Um, I bought a GameCube probably maybe my freshman year of high school, and – that that was the break between me and Nintendo. I was a Nintendo guy up until the GameCube because I realized I bought a GameCube. I bought Soul Calibur. I bought Super Smash. Um, I bought a, maybe like a Mario Party, I think. And then there was nothing else that I wanted to buy. And it was like I suddenly felt like as a high schooler, the gaming content that was being released was not being marketed to me. So I went over to a cousin's house, and he was playing Halo Combat Evolved. He was playing the last mission on CE, the one where you're trying to get out of the Halo ring because it's about to blow up. Sorry, spoiler alert, it's been like 16 years, so I'm sorry. Um, oh, man, I haven't gotten to play that yet. <laughs> you should watch uh, Gamer Husband Newbie Wife on YouTube. <laughs> uh, we're, we're getting there. Um, and I, I watched the Xbox. I watched Master Chief. I watched Halo, and I was like, this feels like a game for me. Like, this feels like a game that is made for, like, my age group, like, teenagers and up. So I bought an Xbox, and that was it. 
I bought an Xbox, an Xbox 360 after that. I bought an Xbox One. And the outside of a Game Boy Advance, I don't remember when I bought that Game Boy Advance, the first Nintendo handheld or console period that I bought since the GameCube was my 3DS, which I bought, I think, last Christmas because I really was craving Pokemon, and I just bought, like, three Pokemon games with my 3DS, and I, you know, I went crazy for a while. Um, so one critical element to highlight about my gaming history and my approach to video games is that I'm very community-driven. So if there's an activity or event that I can do with other people versus something I can do by myself, I will always choose the social and community-driven activity. Um, gaming has always been a social activity for me, and that doesn't mean that I haven't spent a lot of hours playing single-player games, but that even when I'm playing those long single-player campaigns like uh, Dragon Age Inquisition, etc., um, if a friend asks me to play Destiny or Halo or Gears of War with him, I will immediately save my progress on those single player campaigns and I'll jump over to some social gaming experience. And I think that's why I'm a Microsoft Xbox fanboy. From my viewpoint and my understanding, the Xbox has always triumphed. And this really connects with what Nathan was saying. Microsoft and Xbox have triumphed and highlighted the social multiplayer cooperative competitive gaming environment versus the single player experience now that doesn't mean that xbox doesn't have great single player games they do um but that the priority of xbox their priority is as a company as a, as a company culture is to deliver the best social gaming experience through dedicated servers the best quality party chat the best design controllers uh, for competitive and shooter games and the amount of effort that goes into sustaining those networks I am primarily a competitive social gamer, and that's why I play on the Xbox. So that makes perfect sense. So I think we're ready to move on to the next question then uh, for you guys. And I'll answer kind of twofold for me being the Sony side of things. Uh, do achievements drive you, or are they there just as a bonus? Now, for me, I, I didn't play Xbox that long, so achievements didn't really matter to me either. Uh, but even on the PlayStation front, the trophies, if you will, um, I'll normally look at the trophy list, and it's something. If there's trophies I can get easily without going nuts for, I'll grab them. But it doesn't drive me to sit there and say, "Okay, I need to get every trophy in this game," unless they're really easy uh, for me. So I enjoy seeing like, "Hey, you got you know 20 trophies from this game." I like seeing that, but it doesn't drive me to do it. But I know Xbox gamers. Uh, a lot of them are pretty, you know, obs not, I don't want to say obsessed, but they like seeing the <laughs> achievement score go higher and higher and higher. I'm like, hey, I did this. And you'll hear a lot of Xboxers go, oh, my achievement level, I have this many achievements. How many do you have? And it, it's got part of the conversation. I think it's embedded in the culture, if you will, uh, of, of Xboxers. So for you guys in particular, is it something that drives you or is it just kind of an add-on feature that's kind of cool? Uh, let's go to Nathan. Originally, when they came out, I really wanted to get them for all the games that I owned. Um, but that quickly turned into more of a chore than I could ever do. <laughs> so it was, then it became just something kind of cool. But then later on in the 360 generation, it became something that was more interesting to try to see how many achievements I could actually get and kind of get that gamer score level up, even though it was an arbitrary number that meant nothing. Still means nothing really, but, but then, you know, at, Recently, I still don't much care about what my gamer score is. I think I'm in the 80,000s or something like that. But we know somebody who goes by the name of... <clears throat> what's his name? Uh, is it is it Coach... Coach? Coach, Coach Madonna, I think. Coach Mozilla? Mozilla? Coach Mo Moses. Melissa? Coach Moses, yeah. Melissa? Coach Melissa. Okay. Whoa. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Coach Mo, obviously. He, he likes his achievements, and... Um, he recently got over a hundred thousand achievement score, and it's pretty crazy because I've had Xbox Live since it was first available. You know, so I've been playing a lot longer on Xbox than you know he has. But you know, he's definitely dedicated himself to getting those achievements, and it's really cool to see him get so much joy and excitement out of it, and see my my activity feed pop up with all of his achievements that he's getting all the time. <laughs> um, and for a while there, there was you could have leaderboards on Xbox One to see who of your friends like the top three earners of achievements for a, a was it a week or a month or the rotating 10 days or something like that. I can't remember. Yeah. It's like the last five days or something like that. Yeah. yeah. 
Uh, and so I would always constantly try to see if I could even crack that top three because I have a couple other friends on my list too that are also really high up on getting achievements. But, you know, I, I like getting them. Um, I would like to get above 100,000 at this point because I think that'd be kind of cool just to get to that next level. But, you know, as as far as that goes, uh, I, I have a hard time playing games that don't have any sort of achievement on them. You know what I mean? Uh, I Even if it's an achievement or a trophy or you know, a PC game that has their own set of achievements. I like to have something that I earn as I go along the game to kind of document it in a way, you know, like, Hey, I did this. I I got that done. Um, because otherwise I just don't feel like I'm getting much accomplished, which is kind of weird when you say that about any sort of video game, but, uh, it's, I, I like to, to get that reinforcement that, you know, you're getting this achievement because you've done this or that, or, you know, then you can look online at those websites that kind of track those achievements too and be like, oh, this is a super rare achievement that I got. That's really cool. Um, and I, I do, for a while, I tried to make sure I could, I got all the achievements in like the Mass Effect games or the uh, Star Wars games that came out. But there's, there's you know, some that came out that I just couldn't get all the achievements in or I haven't had time to go back and play them. Because as much as I would like to really get all the achievements in games that I really, really enjoy and love... I just don't have the time to, uh, to go back and, you know, play a game multiple times like the Witcher. There's no way I'm going to be able to get all the achievements in that game because I have to go back and play it on a harder difficulty mode. And it'd just be another 80 hours to try to get that. And I just, I don't have that time to dedicate for that achievement, but you know, I, I like the seeing them pop up. It's kind of a nice little thing when it pops up there. I'm like, Hey, cool. Uh, or, when you're playing like on Halo or something like that and you just have these achievements that pop up there for sticking somebody or doing something or the best ones are when you don't even realize that you're going for an achievement and you got it randomly. Yeah. Uh, like, I, I, correct me if I'm wrong, Q, but in Master Chief Collection, there's like 7,000 achievements or something. <laughs> and uh, there, if you play for an hour, you're getting five achievements at least. And a lot of them are ones that are kind of counters that count up like you know you know a certain amount of covenant defeated or grunts or this or that and it's just kind of cool to see those you know pop as they come along and it just keeps keeps you going a little bit i i like the achievements they mean nothing when you look at it from the broad scheme of themes themes but i like them you know if a game doesn't have them then i'm less inclined to play it I'm less inclined to play on Wii U, honestly, because there's no achievement, no documenting that says, hey, you beat this game, you know? I wish there would be something, like, if you if you beat a game, they they, they could do stars, right? Because that, that's always been, like, a Nintendo thing, is the stars. And don't do trophies, don't do achievements, do stars. Like, you know, this game has five stars. If you, you get one star for doing, for beating it this way, uh, another star for doing it this way, and then some arbitrary stuff. I, I just... I would be more inclined to to play something if it had some sort of reward system like that. You know what I mean? That just kind of, it doesn't have to do anything else or tie into any other system, but just be like, hey, you got this for doing this. Congratulations. Here's a sticker. That sounds like that's what Nintendo will end up doing. No achievements, no trophies. We're giving out stickers. Oh, man. (laughs) But but Uh. they'll they'll try to mail them to you. (laughs) Yeah, right. (laughs) You save up all your My Nintendo points, and you can get some Donkey Kong stickers. But anyway, all right. So, Q, what about you? Is it, is achievement something that drives you, or is it just a cool little bonus? Um, it's definitely more of a bonus for me, and I, that makes me more of an outlier when it comes to the probably the average Xbox fanboy. Um, I love getting achievements. I know that for some people, they're the driving factor. I mean, Coach Mo is really big about them. I know he. I, love, I, like, I know he. Uh, I know one time we were playing Overwatch and. Um, I think he was telling me he kept switching characters because he was trying to get all the achievements for every character. Um, the way I approach it is like, man, dude, I want to play Overwatch with the character I like. You know, it's like I'm such a competitive uh, gamer that is more like I want to pr- set myself up for success and be the best player in this you know match. So I'm not going to play with that dumb healer over there. That's not true. I love healers in Overwatch. They're awesome. That's a bad example. But, yeah, so achievements for me are – they're a bonus. Um, if I'm missing one or two in a game, I'll definitely try to get them. Like, if I have all of them except one or two, I'll be like, oh, man, that's going to bother me. Like, a little bit of an uh, OCD kind of thing. But if I have, like, only, like, 15% of them, I'm like, whatever. Like, I'm not going to, like, go out of my way to, to get all of them. 
Um, I think I'm somewhere around 35,000 for gamer score, which is nothing considering that my gamer account is pretty old. Um, but it's mostly because I don't play a lot of games and I hunt down a lot of achievements. I play a few games and I play those games for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of hours. Sure. I think I have almost 300 hours on Halo. I have a thousand on Destiny. I have like 150 on Gears of War. So, I mean, so that's definitely a lot of grinding. You know, at some point, I'm just capping out achievements and I'm not really getting anything else. Um, mm -hmm. I will say one achievement that I'm proud of is getting the legendary achievement for Halo campaign for every single game. Um, for Halo 5, Le the Lone Wolf achievement is really cool because they have concept art on the Xbox. You get concept art that you can set up as your wallpaper for the achievements. So the concept art for the Lone Wolf is Master Chief with some weird futuristic gun, machine gun, and he's surrounded by like a thousand elites. <laughs> and it's like obviously like that's not a realistic gaming scenario, but it's just so cool to see Master right. Chief surrounded by a thousand elites and it's a lone wolf. It's like legendary. You beat the campaign legendary. So having knowing that someone can go into my account and be like, oh man, Lobo Rican, he, he he grinded legendary Halo Five. That that matters to me. So going back to what Nathan said, achievements matter because they tell the story of my gaming history. But if I don't care about a game or I don't care about specific achievement or specific, you know, being known for beating this game, I'm mm -hmm. not going to go out of my way to to hunt them down. There you go. All right. So now let's flip things a little bit here, and I want you guys each, and, I, and I'm going to make it hard on you here, so, and I'm going to hold you to it. Only one answer on this question now. Exclusive title, or I'll give you franchise if you can't pick just one title from the franchise. Which, in your mind, is the best Xbox title or franchise Q you first uh this is a no-brainer man and i hope the audience respects this because i know there's some halo haters out there but uh, not in our audience but just you know gaming world yeah. in general <laughs> sure um i love halo i have read all the graphic novels i've read most of the novels the ones that i haven't read i own them and i just haven't gotten to them because i'm a grad student and i don't have time to read a lot of fiction i own yeah, right. the action <laughs> figures figurines halo legends blu-ray I even have the Master Chief Xbox One controller. Um, like I, I mean, I don't own everything Halo, but like I, whenever I can afford it, and when it's not like a, a hassle, I, I go out of my way to you know get something Halo. Um, I own a Halo uh, Championship Series jersey, which is like a series of jerseys that uh, released by Jinx. Basically, they look like soccer jerseys from the World Cup, but they're designed huh. in Halo style. <laughs> <laughs> so it's cool. kind of like it's like yeah it's kind of like a pro gamer gear but it's kind of like sporty it's really sweet yeah huh. i own one of those um yeah so you know i, I know gear, halo has had some rough patches halo 5 campaigns wasn't great i get it um at the end of the day master chief is probably the most influential video game character icon in my life um up there with mario and um definitely <laughs> Uh, probably Donkey Kong and stuff like that. But I, as an adult, as, as a teenager and up, Master Chief has been there uh, through all my growing pains. So, yeah, Halo for me is the, the, the number one exclusive in Xbox for sure. Cool. Hey, so I'll, I'll go next because I don't have too much experience to go off of it. So I did mention I did play all the Gears of War games. Uh, I really enjoyed 1 and 2. And then three kind of lost me a little bit. It was cool. It just seemed a little, you know, the older ones. It looks like the new ones. Totally flipping the script on that. But they always seem to be a little bit slow, a little bit clunky with the character models. Um, I only played a little bit of like Halo Three. I think is the only one. So I didn't get a lot of time with Master Chief and that that whole story. Um, but one game that I did really enjoy on the Xbox 360, which most people would never be like, that's my favorite franchise. But because of my limited experience, it is uh, Alan Wake. I oh, thought it was man. a really cool game. It, 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 in my mind, it was a great game. It That's was, a good you know, choice. yeah, yeah. It's, it was just different than anything else I had played. I mean, sure, it was similar. There were other games that were similar to it, but at that time, when I had the Xbox 360, I'm like, all right, what game do I want to play? The first one, literally the first one that came to my mind was like, I want to try this Alan Wake I've been reading about, and I had a ton of fun with it. So for me that's mine uh, like i said gears kind of lost me after a while with the story got a little wacky and halo i didn't have the pleasure of playing all the way through them so i can't speak knowledgeably about that one so for me it's alan week uh nathan how about you oh boy are you ready for this <laughs> i you know 
as I'm glad you had me go last because it gave me a lot of time to think over this and wiffle waffle in my brain and my mind because there's so many that I want to say. <sighs> it's a trap. It is a trap. <laughs> uh, you know, <laughs> I can't just Castle there's Crashers. So... <laughs> Boom. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, that is pretty fun. But you know. I really want to say Halo, but at the same time, I I, I think I would be. Uh, I, ah, and I really want to say Forza, but there's one that I really want to say, but I don't know if it really counts because it hasn't appeared since the original Xbox again. That's fine. I I, I had Alan Wake, which up until recently didn't have another iteration too. So I I say go for it. If it was only on Xbox, it counts. Toy Soldiers. <laughs> I'm just naming all of these like Xbox Arcade uh, exclusives. Uh-huh. <laughs> Shadow uh, Complex, go. He, I, I, it's like it's a flip of the coin between these three games that are, these three franchises that I want to say. So I'm just gonna say this one because I I'm about to tweet at Phil Spencer and be like, dude, please bring this back. Please <laughs> bring this chief. back. Crimson Skies. Ooh, nice. Wow, okay. okay. Absolutely exactly. okay. fantastic game. Great protagonist. Uh, amazing airplane mechanics. Uh, it was just so fun. The online was it was great. Uh, it was such a great game. But again, it was just a one and done. I don't know why, but it was such a great game. I have to go with Crimson Skies as being my favorite exclusive that's never appeared anywhere else. Because I can say that the, uh, you know, Halo or Forza has those franchises have appeared on the place or on the PC, but to my knowledge, Crimson Skies never left the Xbox console, so it's got to be Crimson Skies. I love that game. That game is so good. Ah, <sighs> man, if makes me want to go, go if play you tweet it. Phil Spencer about this. I will retweet your tweet and I will like it also. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm going to tweet him before the end of this podcast. Nice. If there was any incentive, it's the incentive of having Loba Rican like and retweet your tweet. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I was just looking up real quick Crimson Skies to make sure it was what I was thinking it was. It did appear on PC, but I mean, Xbox and PC are like the same thing now, so I'll allow it. But it does. <laughs> but see, it does list that there was one on Xbox 360, so I don't know if it was the same game or... There wasn't a Crimson Skies on Xbox 360. It says, Crimson Skies High Road to Revenge. I wonder if it was an that Xbox was, Live arcade thing. No, no, no. Yeah. So High Road to Revenge was the actual name of the oh, yeah. Xbox no, game. It is. Yeah, it, I don't know if they brought it, it could to be backwards, backwards compatible. compatible some, yeah, it must it must be that. Yeah, it was. Okay. Yep, they brought they brought it backwards compatibility, so that's what that was. Okay. Um so all right, so let's move on to the next one. And so to flip it, if you guys could pull one title or franchise from somebody else and throw it on the Xbox so you maybe have that online community Mm -hmm. or you have that controller you guys love so much, what would that franchise be then that you want on Xbox that you don't have currently? Uh, Nathan, let's go to you first. Can can I do more than one? (laughs) Nope, I'm I'm holding it to one. If you need to think think about it, I'm ready if you want to think about it, Nathan. Yeah, good. Q, you go first then while Nathan This was a no-brainer for me. Um, The first one, um, I'll say this one. This is like a minor one. I know you said one. MLB the show because there's no real egg- baseball game on the Xbox. Sure. That bothers yeah, I, me a I, lot. That so makes I feel sense. Like, I feel okay like that. politically correct. I have to say that. <laughs> yeah. But a game that I want on the Xbox and I want it and I, I hate that I want it because it has PlayStation all over it and it's so gross and dirty. But but I want it is Planet Side. I want Planet Side 2 on the oh. Xbox One. And Daybreak Game just became independent from Sony like six months ago. Yeah. Yep. And they made an announcement that they now get to make games from Nintendo and Xbox. And I'm like, oh, my gosh. Please tell me you're bringing Planet Side 2 to the Xbox One. I It's not going to replace Halo for me. But sure. I will pour hours into Planet Side. Once again, I'm telling you, multiplayer, competitive, you mm-hmm. know, team-based, social gameplay. That is yep. a PlayStation game that appeals to me as an Xbox fanboy. I want Planet Side 2. I go on YouTube and I watch gameplays of Planet Side 2, and it's almost like I'm drooling. I'm like, I want to play this so bad, but I can't. <laughs> <laughs> so, 
yeah, from PlayStation. Did you say just PlayStation? Or you said Nintendo. I don't know what you said. Uh, but, either uh, one. It could be anybody. So that that's fine. Okay. So yeah, top Planet Side Two. For Nintendo, I'll say this: I would love to play some Nintendo exclusive games, which will never happen. I mean, unless Nintendo no. takes a downturn. I would just, I just want to play Smash Bros. and not have to buy a Nintendo oh, console. You yeah. know, like, like I don't want to because honestly, I'll buy. I would, ha- I would only buy a Nintendo console just to play that, and maybe Mario Party with my wife and my friends. Mm-hmm. But I don't want to buy a console just for two games. You know, so, yeah. so that's it. Yeah, Planet, but Planet Side Two is the if, if if you told me okay, all the ch- all in on one exclusive, Planet Side Two or just the Planet Side series in in general. Yeah. Sure, that's a good one. Um, so, so for me, I'll, I'll I'll flip it the other way and I'll say an Xbox title I want on on Sony then or Nintendo doesn't really matter either way. I'd say Sony because the graphics gonna be better. Um, for me, I'd like to see. <sighs> Shoot, see, I don't know now. See, now, I had in my head one answer, and now I'm changing it. But well, what uh, was it? What was it? I want to hear it. I'm interested. I'll go. I'll go with the one that came to my mind first. Is I want the new gears on Sony because okay. I think it looks great and I think the the speed up factor is good. It's going to be you know it doesn't not necessarily you know continuing storyline in this case. Um, I just think it, it speed it sped it up a lot and I think that was kind of what eventually pulled me away was the fact it was kind of slower shooter which for me didn't make sense. I like the fast paced shooters. Um, secondly, the one that popped in my head after that is I would love to experience the Halo storyline too. So that kind of showed up first. But Gears is my first option, first thing that popped in my head. So I'll go with that. Um, Nathan, how you doing over there? Oh, I'm here. Okay. <laughs> All right. So I've given it some thought. And since Q already fell on the sword, so I didn't have to choose Smash Brothers. Thank you, sir. <laughs> <laughs> uh... Um, I, I, I have it narrowed down to two franchises now. Okay. So if, I'm going to say both. If you keep both. it short, I'll let you say them both. Good. Okay, I'm going to say both, but I will keep it short. Number one, Uncharted. Sure. Hmm. One, I, I, I like the concept, I like the character, I like the game. I just want to play it on the Xbox controller. Number two, Zelda. Hmm. Ah, okay. Yeah. Okay, I can see that. That, yeah. I mean, it's not gonna happen. But no, <laughs> but, no. But uh, you're, you're more likely yeah. to see Uncharted someday on an Xbox yeah, than you will Zelda, probably. to be honest. But good. See, good answer. See, now I know why you were so torn. That that makes mm-hmm, sense. Mm-hmm. All right. So the the final question I have to kind of wrap this up. Uh, once again, I'm gonna give you one one answer on this one. And this one needs to be a realistic one. So it's not going to be like, oh, bring Uncharted to the Xbox and that, that'll fix it. So, I mean, you guys kind of touched upon it a little bit, especially Nathan, that, you know, Xbox One didn't have the launch that it kind of needed to. And it lost an opportunity to continue its, you know, stronghold on the gaming industry where Xbox 360 was the king. No doubt about it. You know, everybody knew it. But then when the next gen came out, it fell behind because of the inconsistent messaging The hey, we're going to go with this model. Oh, wait, no, we're not. And then, you know, just kind of that whole opportunity there focusing on the being the multimedia center of the home as opposed to the gaming console. So if Microsoft right now were able to load up their golden gun with one golden bullet to make them back on top, what would that golden bullet be in your mind to say, I'm going to Phil Spencer's loading up his gun. I'm going to take this shot. And with this one thing, we're going to be back on top. What would that one thing be? So because Nathan's always <laughs> indecisive, I will give him time and I'll throw it to Q first. Yeah. Um, it, I think it's, it's, it's too late for this console generation. Um, the, the, the gap between the PS4 and the Xbox one is just too great. Um, that doesn't mean I, I man. There's so much. Uh, I'll, I'll add this one thing. There's a lot of negative feedback on Xbox right now because everyone's like, "Well, they're losing." Yeah, they're losing, but they're still making money. You know, it's like just because target, Absolutely. just because some stores out there are not as good as the other competition doesn't mean they're gonna just close shop because they're not making money. Xbox yeah. is making a lot of money. Microsoft is making money. That's why like the CEO of Microsoft was at uh, E3 this year for the, the the conference. That was huge. That was huge for them. Um, the, the, the key thing for Phil Spencer is, man, it, it's, a, it's a combined package of beat PlayStation on the price for the next generation of consoles. And I know that's hard to predict right now, but uh, a big edge of the 360 had on the PS3 was the price. It was a cheaper console. Um, it, you, have, you need to come out first, come out cheaper, and just get your and be pro gamer. 
That's that's the key. Come out first. To, if you, even if you have a weaker technology, if you come out first, that just gives you an edge in people buying your console when there's nothing else to buy. Sure. Come out um, cheaper. You know, match the price of the other console or go below it. I mean, for a lot of people, it's just money, man. Fifty bucks, a hundred bucks. That's 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 a that's a big difference to a lot of people. Um, mm-hmm. And yeah, and and, and you yeah, you need to be pro gamer, and that's what Phil Spencer has on. I love Phil Spencer. I really would love to. Yeah. He's one of those corporate leaders in America that I would love to hang out with for like a day, an afternoon because it's like Phil is a gamer. I see him on Xbox Live every night. He's playing a different game. He's on it and every night. He gets night. it. He just yeah. gets it. Absolutely. He's a he's a nerd. He's a geek like me. You know, he's like <laughs> he's he's one of us. He understands what gamers want, and he's like the message needs to be pro gamer. Not not pro as in professional, but you know, yeah. uh, in favor of gamers and just have the co- consumer and and what the consumer wants first. So I know that wasn't a one bullet gun, but it's it's a combined a package of yeah, it's it's <laughs> a combined. Be first, be cheap, be pro gamer. That's it. Okay, so I don't think it's too late this generation because if the, as long as the generation has the same length life cycle that the last one did or more, who knows. Um, I think Xbox can still do it, but in my mind, the first thing that comes to me, and they've done some course correction in this matter uh, already, but it, it's a little late, is the games. I think that Xbox One had some missteps as far as getting content out there and the content that people wanted. So Halo 5 took a while. You had the Master Chief Collection in between, which was awesome, but I mean, when that thing launched, it was broke. So they had to fix that. So it was just a lot of missteps, it looks like. And it was almost a Nintendo route where, like, hey, we got this console. You might be interested in it. But, I mean, the content is going to be few and far between. So then they started reaching out and getting these timed exclusives, you know, like Tomb Raider, which it, that's a great move. Don't get me wrong. But I want to see exclusives. I want to see good first-party content. Now, you have Sony who has, you know, like Infamous. You have your Uncharted. You have your Last of Us. You have... You know, there's all these titles that every E3 they come out and say, and you can only play this on PlayStation, where Microsoft had that gap and it didn't really hit. Now, they have an opportunity right now where Sony, everything Sony has on the table is out for pretty much almost a year at this point. So they have a, you know, a good string right now coming up with the gears. Uh, I know Crackdown's coming out, stuff like that, where they're going to have those exclusives. If those hit and those are good games, you can only get an Xbox One. That's the path they need to take. And I think if they do that, they can still do it this gen. If not, Q, I agree with your uh, analysis for what they need to do to come out swinging next gen is come out first, come out reasonably priced. I think that that would be the way to fix it if they can't do it this gen. And, and so, just to add yeah. to what you said, Kevin, that's I think that is why there's been a lot of discussion online about why the Scorpio was announced at E3. And I think that's part of it. It's Phil Spencer yeah. saying, you know what? We don't have a lot to give you guys yet, but here it is. Here is the, you know, the Holy of Holies. Here's the Holy Grail. And we came out with the announcement first. And yeah, the, the, the PS4 Neo is, is also an announcement, but, but the Scorpio, they announced the next generation first. So now it's almost like Spencer is saying we control the timeline, we control the the news releases. So it's kind of like it's kind is what you said. It's trying it's getting ahead of the curve. So I think Phil Spencer is very aware of what what if they if they can write the course, how, what it takes to do that. So. Absolutely, they just need to continue listening to him. I agree with you definitely there. So Nathan, are you are you still indecisive? Do you have that noose around your neck, or, or you got a plan for Xbox? Xbox already has a plan. It's a good plan. They they got Scorpio on the horizon, like you said there, so they've got the silver bullet with the most powerful console coming down in the market. They already have the best online service with Xbox Live Gold. Um, they have really good lineups consistently for the Games with Gold program. They consistently have free play weekends, so you can play a game for free just to try it out. Um, they, they reward you if you're an Xbox Live, you know, user, you can go onto the Xbox Live reward site and build up and get rewards back on all your purchases that you make every, you know, on digital content. They have a a robust, uh, matchmaking system and a friends party system that lets you get up to, was it 16 people now, uh, in a chat? 
so you can all talk and it's a really good high quality uh they let you use skype on there they uh, they now have 4k blu-ray playing capabilities and netflix on the xbox one s they are already doing what they need to do people are just already ingrained with that they're the underpowered system of the two and that they're uh, lagging behind because of that message is still ringing in the ears. They can't go back and and take a time machine and transpose uh, what was his name? Uh, ben Dan Dan Matrick Dan oh, Matrick. Yeah. I think it was Dan Matrick. <laughs> they can't take a time machine back and put Phil Spencer out there and have his message instead of Dan Matrick's message, right? Uh, if they could, that's what they should do right there. Uh, get that time machine thing going on. But it would make that uh, a video segment with Roger Goodell, the NFL's commissioner, so much more awkward than that was. <laughs> <laughs> uh-huh. So here's what I uh, here's what they could do. You know, they're they're already on the right path. They are doing amazing things over there. Uh, just double down again on the network infrastructure. Make Xbox Live the premier online system. Um, no, just double down on your server strength and your bandwidth that you have available. Make yourself having more redundant points across the nations, across the globe, uh, and just make sure that your network is rock solid, that there can be no outages because that's your claim to fame as Xbox Live right now because you are the company that has Azure. You are the cloud computing company at this point. So, but aside from that, they... If they were to do Nathan's method of making, you know, one more amazing thing, right? I would say they go out and they they have every Xbox exclusive is now platform agnostic. You can play it on your Xbox One, Xbox 360, um, like generationally capability, of course. So Xbox games that they put out would now be playable on Xbox 360 and Xbox One, 360 and Xbox One, and all of them on PC using Windows 10 on the Xbox platform. So that they can just play your games wherever you want to play them, and that's that. The other thing, if they really want to make a mark and they really want to take a slam dunk, is either make Xbox Live gold free or make it a minimal 10 20 a year cost you know because they have to have the cost to back up the servers and everything that they're putting into the support uh that's why they, they cost that much a year so my my secondary thought would be okay if you can't do it in its current state knock it down to 20 dollars a year for the the current feature set that you have but take away games with gold and then make it $50 a year for a premium Xbox Live experience that includes games with gold and something else that they give you for paying the extra amount each month. You can get the subscription service. You can get, I don't know, something else that makes it more of a premium experience, right? Uh, but lower the entry point that you have now to play online gaming, either to free or to like 10 or $20 a year. That'll be huge. You'll get more subscribers that way. You'll People with the communities that have built up will use that. They'll resubscribe. You'll have a lot more people that were silver now go gold just because they, you know, it's cheap. Why not? And then if you have a fifty dollar price point where you get these games with gold games and you get more games with gold games and you get um, double the games with gold games. Let's say you get instead of four a month, you get eight a month. Uh, that would be a really cool selling point. I think it would be awesome. Uh, also, throw in a free movie from the Xbox Video Store or you know, a TV show or something that would be just more adding all the services, bringing them all together, make their Xbox uh, music service free for that, that platform. Uh, there's a lot of things that they could do. Also, you can maybe implement, if you're on that platform, you get 20% off digital content. You know, any digital content across the board on the Xbox Live Store, 20% off. I think that that would really be an amazing way to bolster their online presence and really say look at us we are the, the the destination for your online community we really cherish you as a user of xbox live gold we we want to make this affordable for anybody who wants to play it you know because we have to support our servers but if you want to you know really be the on the premiere experience you get this xbox live premium it's it's 60 dollars or it's 50 dollars 
and this is what you get with that and just have this amazing premier online experience and that is what gets you the the market share i like it well thank you gentlemen for giving me some insight into the mind of an xbox gamer so i think it's time to move away from xbox at least the mindset of xbox gamers and move into a little bit of news this week in play some video game news Q, buddy, what do you got for news this week for us? I got you, man. Uh, BlizzCon, and I think that's how you say it. I'm sorry if I didn't pronounce it enough with a Z. Overwatch has surpassed 15 million total players, including all platforms. And at BlizzCon 2016, which was, uh, well, the announcement was made a couple of days ago, the World Cup of Overwatch has been announced. No prize money, but 16 teams from around the world, Kevin, will compete for pride and glory, and an all-paid expense trip to uh, to BlizzCon for the championship uh, tournament. So Overwatch is a game that came out what May, March? I don't I don't even remember anymore. April. Is it April or May? Yeah. Yeah, and they. I mean, it's if people were asking, is this a game that's gonna go pro? Like, are, are people gonna be able to compete? And BlizzCon, uh, Blizzard said, hey, don't worry about it. We're gonna make it go pro on our own dime. So it seems like, once again, no prize pool for this competition, but I'm sure for next year, for the next one, there will be a prize pool. Cool. Sounds good. I, I'm not surprised it's going to have some sort of competition. I would be surprised if it doesn't eventually go, quote, unquote, pro as well. Um, so I have a little bit of news, and uh, this comes from Bethesda's QuakeCon, actually. So it's all about convention news right now. Uh, if you haven't head, head headed I did over to our site already. Uh, earlier today, I posted the first gameplay footage trailer of Prey from Bethesda. So it gives you your first look at some actual gameplay and and possibly how the game works as far as the shooting mechanics and what you're what you're going up against, which is some pretty fierce looking shape shifting alien type things. So it looks pretty cool. It game still looks promising in my opinion, so I'm, I'm still excited about it. But you can hop on playsomevideogames.com and check that out. Q, what else you got? Yeah, man. Uh, so they was announced uh, at the latest um, Activision, um, I guess, second quarter earnings meeting. I don't know who goes to that, but it happened there. That a majority of the team at Bungie has shifted from working on Destiny 1 to Destiny 2 or Destiny the sequel. Actually, the Activision CEO, Eric Hirschberg, actually used the term Destiny 2. Which is kind of uncreative to me. It seems kind of lame. You just call it Destiny 2. It's like, whoa, we get like Fate 3? I don't know. Anyway. So it's interesting <laughs> for me as, as a hardcore Destiny player for me because Rise of Iron is coming out in September. And Destiny 2 is probably not going to come out till fall of 2017. And to that, the fact that most of Bungie is switching over to Destiny 2 tells me, oh, you guys are basically going to be running the infrastructure for destiny one so between rise of iron and destiny two i doubt we're gonna get any new content which is fine i mean that was expected but it just means that i hope destiny doesn't have a little bit of a drop off in its in its user base as they go into e3 and destiny two maybe maybe it won't maybe they don't care maybe they feel pretty confident about where they're at Hmm. but it's just uh, it's a big deal when a, a studio shifts like a big part of its core uh, workforce into the next big project. So, yeah, I mean, it, it makes sense. I think Destiny Two is kind of an odd name, but considering they've had the two, I, mean, I guess you call them expansions already. What was it? The Taken King and and then Rise of Irons coming out. Is that what it is? Those are the two big ones. They had two other smaller yeah. ones, which um, we are very ashamed of. Okay, so I mean, you look at it this way: is the game has basically had what's going to end up being four expansions already, two good ones, two not so good ones. But yeah, I think if you just continue naming it Destiny and give it a different subtitle, that might confuse people as to do I need to have the first game or you know something like that. So it, while I agree with you, it's uncreative. Maybe it'll be like Destiny Two, blah blah blah, something at the end of it to kind of help it. But yeah, it seems a little bit unoriginal. So Nathan, what do you got? You got anything? Well, it's not really news, but the Xbox One S released on August 2nd for the 2TB edition. The launch edition, as they call it, um, 
I have one. Nice. And what was that, Q? I was gonna say, is it pretty? <laughs> oh yeah, it's 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 sleek, it's sexy, it's smaller. Um, all the S words that we can use to describe it, obviously. So basically, what I was wanting to do is kind of give you my quick impressions on that, um, and just kind of give you my initial thoughts on the Xbox One S. So it's considerably smaller. Uh, even though the pictures don't really do it justice, right? If you look at this thing online, there's it is smaller. But again, to me, the size of the Xbox One wasn't much of a what's wasn't really an issue. The power brick on the other hand was because man, <laughs> yeah. when I when I was moving with that thing and I tried to reset it up and everything, I was like, man, this brick is really just in the way, isn't it? And you just got to figure out where to put it, and it, it gets hot on its own, so you don't necessarily want to have it in an area where it's not going to get proper ventilation or anything. So having that gone is just a, a plus. Additionally, that thing is still whisper silent. It is it is running, and you can't even hear it. My external hard drive makes more noise than that thing does. The PlayStation 4 sounds like a jet taking off compared to that thing. Um <laughs> And it's just, it's, the form factor is really small. And it, the box is smaller than a, and I'm talking about, when I say the box, I think the actual box, it's it's placed on the marketing shelves on. It's it's a, a smaller box than the Xbox, or than the PlayStation 4 box. I, I took a picture of that and put them side by side. Mm-hmm. Um, the actual unit itself is somewhat very comparable in size of the PS4 and in some ways very much smaller. Um the the nice thing is I don't have a 4K TV that I hook, have it hooked up to, but I have a uh, 1080p LCD. And one thing that I noticed, and I don't know if that's if it's due to the HDR or anything on this, because my TV doesn't have HDR, but it could just be outputting in more of a broader spectrum. Is that the the darks in this now are darker? Sure. I've noticed that when I'm playing games, when I'm watching TV or video, that the it used to be um, that it was a little bit more grayer on my on the old Xbox, but now it's like black, black. You can't even tell that there's anything else other than black on the screen. So and that's a, a weird little notice thing that I found that I haven't seen anybody else talk about yet unless you have like the HDR support, but I don't. Uh, so it's pretty cool to see that that's out there, improving things upon that. The... The thing that kind of bums me out is that we, and I already knew it, and everybody knows it, they removed the connect port from the unit. Yeah, and I saw the hookup for that. It's crazy if you want to hook it up now. Yeah, it's it's a little adapter that requires power because the connect requires more power than, than you would anticipate it would. And the thing that bums me out is that, okay, I have, there, the Xbox has three USB ports on it. Three. Why couldn't you just put one more on there on the back? So make right. a total of four. So there's one in the front, and you want to use that for your controller, obviously with play and charge kit. Um, that's at least that's what I use it for. And on, in the back, I have my external hard drive hooked up to one of them. And currently, I have my um, USB tuner for the over-the-air HD antenna mm-hmm. to go through the other one. So they're all used at this point. If I want to use the connect adapter, I'm going to have to plug that thing in into the front when I'm not using a controller. And just do that, and it won't look as good. So the kind of that's the the bummer to me is that yeah. when I get that adapter, I'm not going to necessarily want to have it always hooked up. So I won't always have those voice commands available. It'll just have to be for when I want to play a connect game. So, which will be never. We know that's okay. <laughs> well, I, I've got a few <laughs> that I, I would play. Star Wars um, only. Mm, Star Wars, the Disney Fantasia is actually pretty good. Oh, okay. um, and there's another one, the uh, Dance Central Spotlight, that's kind of good too. Ah, nice. And I have the Xbox Fitness, but that's about to go away for the, the deep sleep. Um, <laughs> but you know, it, it's a it's a good console. It looks really good. It feels really good. Like the controller is pretty cool. Again, I won't use that controller a lot on my actual Xbox. I'll I'll probably take it up here and put it in my on my Windows 10 computer, so when I play up here, I can use that controller. But right. it feels good in your hand. It has Bluetooth now. Um, still, it it ships with two AA batteries for the controller. Mm. Uh, and, and you would think that by now that they would include a, a rechargeable battery 
but they don't, and whatever, it's fine. I prefer external batteries to internal batteries anyway, whether it be uh, going to, to pay 10 bucks or whatever it is for the uh, rechargeable unit to put in there, or getting batteries to replace it, because on the PlayStation, I, I just don't like the all-in-one unit, you know, where if the battery dies and just doesn't hold the charge, you can't do anything about it, you just gotta get a new controller. Because uh, I don't know about you guys, but I get a little sentimental to controllers sometimes. Uh, you know, we, we've been through a long road, me and that controller, and I don't necessarily want to throw it away. Uh, but I just want to replace the battery. And the PlayStation, you can't do that. But I do like that you can at least replace the batteries on the Xbox. Sure. Um, I haven't played any uh, 4K Blu-rays yet because, like I said, I don't have a 4K TV. It won't do me any good. Um, it's it's a nice unit. Overall, good, 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 uh, good purchase, I think. Uh, if you are on the fence on getting one, I would say wait until those bundles start coming out. There's going to be one for the uh, Halo fans out there with the Xbox uh, Master Chief Collection and the Halo 5 game uh, for the 500 gig version of it, and that's going to be 299. And then there's also going to be for 350 a version for the Madden 17 game that's going to come with the Madden. Uh, 17 game and for you gears fans there's going to be for 450 a two terabyte unit that has a custom paint job and it comes with the ultimate edition of gears of war 5 so if you're if you're new to the xbox ecosystem and you want to get an xbox and you don't have one for sure go get this thing it's it's a good piece of hardware if you're upgrading um if you can get a good trade-in value or a good sell value on your current xbox sure go for it uh but other than that there's really no terrible need to uh that i can find at this point um and if you're a heavy connect user you may want to just avoid it for now you know it's just kind of one of those things where they they took that port away maybe for size constraints or maybe because of the power adapter they just couldn't do it with the power supply that they put in there but whisper silent runs really well looks really good and oh it, it has a an actual tactile button now for the power which i like I prefer that button to the the touch button of before on the original oh, Xbox yeah. Yeah. one. So uh, overall, good system, good unit, and I I recommend it. Do you guys have any questions about the unit? Uh, the only thing I was going to ask was about the the Connect setup because I had seen pictures of the the adapter, which you said this little adapter. It's not. It's like four cables, and it, it's actually pretty big. Uh, I mean, it's not as big as, like, the power brick was in the old one, but it seemed like a lot of cables for something that was, like, there's such a small percentage of people that actively use their Connect. I think, other than maybe voice controls. Uh, that was the only thing I was going to ask you about, but you touched on that anyway, so. And I know the Elite controller is the best controller in the market. Uh, I was going to ask you about the new, improved Xbox One S controller, but I went to the Microsoft store in my in my town, in my city, and I got to play with that controller and it's okay. It's like a midpoint between the standard Xbox One controller and the Elite, but mm-hmm. uh, it's, it feels good. It feels better, but it's basically the same. It's not mm-hmm. that much of a, a push forward. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it feels better than the original Xbox con- One controller, but still not as good as the Elite. But hey, it's it's a good secondary option. And that, so, that's expected, considering how much you pay for the Elite anyway. That you know you weren't going to get that for quote unquote free with the console, so. I think it's a happy medium. So thank you for sharing that, Nathan. Appreciate it. And we have to figure out either a bet or I mean, maybe we'll do it without losing a bet to get you to stream some footage of you playing Dance Central. I think that'd be pretty yeah. awesome. Woo-woo. I want to <laughs> see that. Uh, oh, likey. Uh, that's, that's, I, I regret everything. I regret yeah. that. <laughs> yeah, we'll just pretend that didn't happen. But we're not going to edit that out. We're just going to pretend it didn't no, happen. No, so. I, I deserve it. It's okay. <laughs> All right. So Q, you got any other news for us this week? Uh, yeah, I got a couple of small stories. The first one is that Quake Champions is a game that the trailer, yeah, it was a CGI trailer, but I thought it looked cool. It was a very you know action friendly. It is not coming to consoles. Uh, Bethesda it wants to run it at 120, 120 hertz with an uncapped frame rate. So basically, it's a PC made game. Like they wanted that game to yeah. run absolutely beautiful, beautifully. Um, and when they were asked about future consoles. They're like, well, uh, we like the, uh, he says, Bethesda is all about more powerful consoles. They're all about it. They, they support it. They're all about it. So when they were asked about the PS4 Neo and the Scorpio, they said, look, if they bring it, if they bring the hardware and the power to run this kind of game, 
we are not going to eliminate the like the possibility of bringing this game to consoles. So for now, it will be a PC game, which kind of bumps me out because I was like, I was, I knew it was gonna be a PC game, but I was like, ah, maybe, maybe, but no, <laughs> it's okay. And the other story, the final story that I have is about Pokemon Go uh, bots. You know, they're killing the game. And well, that's the question: Are they killing the game? There's basically these bots out there you can sign up for that they basically they kind of play the game for you i don't know exactly how it works i'm not a coder i'm not a programmer but apparently there's about three hundred thousand bot users in the pokemon game wow sphere and i i if if yeah if, if it's three hundred thousand bots out of 15 million players i don't know how many people play pokemon go the, the question is are three hundred thousand bots really killing the game i don't know no one knows but it seems like Niantic has begun banning accounts that seem to be somehow connected to bots. So the question is, can Niantic track every single bot software being used out there? Um, probably not. It's, they probably can't do that. <laughs> Once again, I'm not a technical person, but it seems to me like anyone out there with the skills can design a bot to run, you know, I guess to run. People are already doing it. Can they catch everybody? Probably no. And if they can't catch everyone, this, will it kill the game? We have yet to find out. So it's kind of it's like an open discussion about bot using bot usage with a game like Pokemon Go, where grinding out the game takes so long, and there's people using these bots, and they just basically get to play. Uh, they get to uh, they get to run through the game much much faster and easier uh, easier than uh, other players. So. It- and that's weird too. So I, I I've seen a lot of stories about Pokemon Go this week. You know, taking away the the footstep tracking and like, hey, we're working on it. We'll bring it back. And people just flipping out about that. <laughs> it may maybe it's just me, but in my mind, especially and this goes even more for bot users. Once you have them all, what's the point of playing the game anymore? I don't know, man. Like. I don't the gyms, nobody hangs onto a gym long enough to, to get the rewards for the most part, at least in my areas. You can never hold the gym for more than a couple hours at the most. I think the longest I had one was eight hours. You don't get rewards until you have a gym in your control for 23 hours is when you get the first payout. So yeah. that's insane. But in my mind, like I'm just having fun. You know, I'll, I'll battle gyms here and there, but the main fun I'm having is just like, oh, do I have this Pokemon yet? Or, oh, have I evolved this Pokemon yet? So let me catch the ones that evolve it. I'm just having fun with that. If somebody gave me the option to like, hey, you can unlock them all right now, I wouldn't do it because then it's like, okay, well then I'm just done. What what am I playing for? Like it takes all the the, the fun away from it, at least for me. But yeah, I mean, I don't think they'll be able to shut them all down. But people that are doing it, I don't know what you're doing it for because why are you gonna play after that? There's nothing left to do. So absolutely, I, I completely agree with you, Kevin. I I agree. Mm-hmm. Yeah. All right, so that wraps it up for the news. And unfortunately, boys and girls, it's about that time where we got to pack up our wagon here and and hit the dusty trail. But before we do, we're going to tell you about some things you should check out. So, Nathan, do you have any plugs for this week? As I alluded to earlier, I wrote an article on gamers, who are we, and uh, the gaming community, and my personal experience uh, with gaming and the community that have uh, arisen for me. And I was just curious of anybody else who read the article and had similar experiences or just what your comments and thoughts are on gaming and the community that forms around it. Um, Check it out on the site, playsomevideogames.com. Let me know what you think. I'd love to hear what you thought. Uh, You can hit me up directly on Twitter at SithNightmare, S-I-T-H-K-N-I-G-H-T-M-A-R-E. Let me know what you thought. Other than that, I uh, recorded today Suicide Squad podcast for nice. uh, That's Entertaining. So Hello. I'll get that put up and edited up soon. And yeah, you'll, you'll be able to hear my thoughts on Suicide Squad. Awesome. Can't wait. i uh, hoping to check that out sometime soon with my kids as well. So looking forward to see your take on it or hear your take on it rather. Uh, Q, what do you got you want to talk about? I want to do a shout out to the newest member of our team, Seth Roy. Seth, welcome to the team, man. Uh, I look forward to working with you, podcasting with you, maybe at some point down the road, or just you know having you in part of our team is awesome. Uh, and I want to do, you know basically uh, plug in his review, his very first review, uh, Headlander. Um, go check it out. I read it; it's solid. Uh, I think Seth is a former journalist, mm-hmm. so he brings a lot of great experience and expertise to the team. I'm excited he's with us. Uh, go to the website, check out his review. It's up there on the on the main page uh, near the top. 
yep. read it. And yeah, if you can find him on Twitter, I, I don't think I've added him on Twitter actually. But when you find him, say hi. He will be grateful. He seems like a good guy. There you go. And uh, the developer for Headlander actually liked and retweeted out his review as well. So getting oh, yeah. attention from the guys who made it, which is awesome. So uh, as you as you said, Q, welcome aboard, Seth. Um, so uh, Nathan had mentioned before, you know, website, playsomevideogames.com. Make sure to hit up all of our reviews, news, and, of course, join us in the forum. Uh, Donnie and Kyle hosted the first, and actually Coach Mo was there as well, hosted the first PSVG Poker Night on PS4. You can check out information on that on the website and the forums and join us. The The guys said they're looking to do it either bi-weekly or at least once a month, so join us for the next round. I'll be jumping on there eventually, too. Um, you can always, as we mentioned earlier, you can email us at podcast at playsomevideogames.com. You can follow us on Twitter at underscore PSVG. Uh, and if you haven't already, like us on Facebook, facebook.com backslash playsomevideogames, or just search play some video games at the top of Facebook, and we will pop up uh, most likely as your number one result. Um, we have our Twitch and YouTube channels up there as well, so check out... Uh, those for most recently, uh, most recent episodes of Veteran Gamer Newbie Wife installments, uh, and as I mentioned as well, I stream the entire Saints Row Get Out of Hell uh, up on the YouTube channel, so those are there. Um, and as always, please continue to share us with your friends and family. Uh, we rely on all of you to get the word out. Uh, don't forget to rate us on iTunes. Uh, and if this is your first episode listening, welcome aboard. Um, we recently had a huge influx of uh, followers and people checking us out, uh, actually in the thousands of you. So if you're listening, thank you, and keep tuning in week after week. It'll be different every week for you. Um, and yeah, that's pretty much it, guys. So um, I don't know about you, but uh, as always, I'm never going to stop gaming. Thank you for listening to Play Some Video Games, the official podcast.